So Andy, I just we're all wrestling with these questions as we're dealing with this at least triple headed monster here of uh, you know the pandemic, economic uh, deep freeze, and uh, now all of these issues around uh, racial equity, which are so important to deal with, and so uh, you know we were we're wrestling with it too late in many places, but it's good that we're finally wrestling with it. As you you know consult with companies to help them through these times and said i know your work is to help people integrate mindfulness into executive culture and also the culture of of the entire organization what kind of advice are you giving to people as individuals for wrestling with these profound issues yeah thanks dan um it's really unprecedented the um the level of uh, change and um uncertainty that we're facing right now and it's, it's touching everybody. Um, having said that, it's important to recognize that it is uh, touching people differently. It's affecting people very differently, depending on your work situation, um, depending on your, your um, you know, the position and the discussion and the context that, you're, that you have in terms of dealing with racial issues and discussions. Um, different people are in very different places, and I think that's an important thing to remember. Um, but in terms of how to deal with it, the first thing I think that's really important to know, to know is that if you're stressed out right now, you're completely normal. And um, it's not something that's wrong with you. It's not something that you should try to avoid or run away from. It's something that is important to acknowledge and to deal with um, as best we can. Um, so that's the first thing to say. If I'm stressed, uh, I don't want to deny it. I don't want to um, pretend that it's not there or avoid it, but just kind of be with it and to some extent be okay with it and also have some self-compassion is the other kind of place, the foundational thing that we want to do. Sometimes stress will lead us to say the wrong thing or, um, or do something that we regret, and that's natural too. And knowing that it's okay to screw something up and, and then come back and say, you know, that didn't come out the way I meant it or I thought about it. Um, and I'd like to kind of rephrase or revisit what I said. So the first thing is to really just re recognize that this is just another part of um, everybody's experience. We need to um, recognize it as something very normal and give ourselves a little break as we, as we deal with it. Yeah, I think that's really important. Uh... There's a cliche in the meditation world of that, that, that we take from the airline safety instructions where they say, put your own oxygen mask on first. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not a huge fan of cliches, but it's a useful one in this context. It's going to be hard for you to be useful and helpful in an organization, in a family, in any structure, if you are a mess. So I think a lot of people are new to meditation as a form of self-care they may have heard about it but they're not actually doing it or they're a big fan of meditation for other people but are not actually doing it themselves so what what do you say as somebody who's in the business of of helping people uh boot up meditation habits and then integrate mindfulness into their work lives how do people get started hmm. well first of all I just want to acknowledge that meditation is something that's really popular now and is also there's a lot of research behind it, as you know, Dan, that, that says that it's probably one of – if you're going to spend 10 minutes doing something, meditation is probably the best thing that you can spend those 10 minutes doing, and that's more true now than ever. Um, I think that, honestly, there are some great apps that are out there. Um, one that you're, you're familiar with, Dan, called 10% Happier. Um, there's others such as Headspace and calm and insight timer and just being able to um as a as a first kind of toe in the water plug in download an app and just do a five minute mindfulness practice and learn a little bit about it is a great way to get started and then there's a lot of directions you can go from there but i would say just start very small you know if you can start with just one five minute experience and maybe do it in a couple days do it a couple days in a row and just notice what happens notice if it works for you that's a great place to start. The, the, the work you do is focused not only on, as I understand it, working with individuals, um, 
uh, in helping people think about how they can integrate mindfulness into their work lives, but also working with organizations. If I'm an executive and I'm interested in helping my team learn more about meditation and mindfulness, uh, which of course the research shows can help with everything from focus to uh, emotional reactivity. So it's deeply useful in any context, but in particular, uh, surely in a work as well. Um, how do what's the what are the do's and don'ts of getting this out to an organization? Because I, I can imagine there are some pitfalls. There are, and uh, some of them are due to just over enthusiasm. Because a lot of times, people who discover meditation and find that it works for them, the first thing they'll say is, "Boy, I know some people who really need this. I'm going to get this on their on their calendar," and um, and that's coming from a good place. Uh, but, you know, we have to be sensitive to whether people are open to this or not, if this is the right time for them to, to, to get in, to try something new. Hopefully it is, but it may just be that they're overloaded. Um, so I would say, you know, soft touch is good, number one. Um, present something that's very accessible. Like I said, maybe say, look, I'm using this app. It's working for me. You may want to try it. Um, but really the best advertisement for mindfulness is, is how you come across yourself. So if you're someone who practices mindfulness or is just kind of learning about it, um, if you can bring that into the way you lead meetings, into the way you interact with people, then at some point people are going to say, there's something going on with you and I'd like to learn more about it. And that's really the best place to start. Um, now, there are things that we can do, like, for, for instance, just taking a moment, taking a minute of silence before we start meetings. That's not a high bar. Anybody can do that. And if you tell people that you're going to do it and then just do it before they have a chance to complain, they usually don't regret it. Um, so very small things like that can also work to introduce people to the concept. Uh, I've been watching my wife, who's a physician. We've been watching this documentary series on Netflix called Lennox Hill, which is a basically a, a cameras embedded for a significant period of time in this hospital on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. And, and they just follow the action and it's it's fascinating. And uh, one of the things they do before surgery, the neurosurgery team, is they take uh, a time out and they all just stand there, take a few deep breaths and silence before they do any surgery. And, you know, I, I think there's data to show that this improves outcomes. And of course it will work. Uh, it can, you know, we do it a lot in company meetings at, at my company, 10% Happier. Um, it's it's just a nice reset but that's you know the, i don't want to paint what we've just described as superficial because it's not but it can go much deeper in terms of getting people actually engaged in the practice of meditation as a daily or daily ish habit um and while there are these pitfalls of you know being an evangelist um and being incredibly annoying as an evangelist um the exact there's a there's a great cartoon that ran in the new yorker uh, uh, that said, um, that had two women having lunch and, uh, one of them says to the other, I've been gluten free for a week and I'm already annoying. And that reminds me of what sometimes happens with uh, people who, uh, <laughs> get into meditation. um, so, so what, in terms of having stated the pitfalls in terms of if I'm an, if I'm a manager uh, and I want to get this out to the team in a deeper way than just a, a, a minute of silence at the beginning of meetings as salutary as that practice can be. Um, what what other do's and don'ts do you have in mind? Um, do's and don'ts for bringing mindfulness to, um, to your team or to your organization. I yeah. think the first thing is you wanted to dispel some myths, which is that this is um, religious practice or this conflicts with someone else's religious practice. Um, and these are pretty easily dispelled once people experience mindfulness, but they are out there. Um, and then also this idea that mindfulness is going to take time. It's something that I have to do that's going to – it's another thing to do on my calendar. But once you start practicing mindfulness, you'll realize very quickly that it actually seems to create time. It seems to create more space in our day. Um, those are a couple of things that I think are important. And in terms of an organization – 
you know, organizations can, they can bring apps in as an organization or they can bring training programs in. Um, and also I find that grassroots or uh, kind of organic groups that start in companies are really some of the most impactful and the most sustainable. So if you have an employee resource group, if you have a group of employees, a group of people that are interested in doing it, just start a group. You know, it doesn't have to go through HR. It doesn't have to involve technology. Chances are there are people in your organization that are interested in mindfulness. And if you can find them and start something grassroots where people see that the people that they know and that they work with participating, that's a really good way to, to get some traction. I agree with that, and I've seen that in corporations, as I'm sure you have. General Mills, I've written about how the uh, just one person in the C-suite began a whole cultural shift by Janice Martirano is her name. Um, that 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 cultural shift just came not not as a, a top-down thing, but she just started to meditate. People asked her what was going on, why did she seem so happy and calm, and then uh, then she started teaching them how to do it, and then we just rolled from there. So I see we have Sana with us now. Sana, um, welcome back. Thank you. I'm. Uh, I was giving myself a timeout. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So, technical difficulties. Sure, let me start. Uh, yes. Well, we're all familiar with technical difficulties there of Zoom. Um, well, let me start with a question. Let me go to you now with the question I was going to start with, which is. What uh, in your role, what kind of issues are you seeing? I know you can't breach confidentiality, but what kind of issues are you seeing surface uh, on the team at Chevron? So, uh, yeah, confidentiality is pretty much the basis of our work. But what I can share with you is, look, right now we are experiencing a global pandemic. In fact, we're, we're actually facing two pandemics. One is COVID and the second is racism. And so what we're helping employees with right now is how to address those types of concerns that they're dealing with working from home, uh, work-life balance, working um, with their dependents like myself, uh, I've got three children under the age of 10, and uh, I'm escaping to the office to be able to do what I need to do to do my job. Um, we're also dealing with challenges with people who are really expressing burnout. You know. Uh, 35% of millennials um, in a MetLife study recently shared that there's a significant burnout of people working from home right now. And so we're helping them to have those conversations with their supervisors, realign their priorities. But ultimately, our space is there to help them to feel as if they can bring their best self to work. And we have 10 to 15 different solutions and Chevron is a huge global organization. So we're really hearing different concerns from all over the world and helping them to bring their best self to work every day, stay focused and re realize that we're really in the What do you recommend for grant for people? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? <laughs> when you when people come to you talking about burnout, what what is the what kind of conversation do you engage in with them in terms of working toward solutions? So when right now when it comes to burnout is it depends on on the type of role. But right now there's people who are working home with children, with dependents. Uh, we're all working, some of us are working from home, at least in the US, um, in other parts of the globe, in China and other locations, we're actually almost back to 100% in, in those locations. But when you're working from home, there's so many different factors which are uh, affecting us, right? It's not just the news and everything that we're hearing uh, and dealing with the pandemic, but we're also dealing with uh, we're really dealing with a psychological, constant psychological underlying um, uh, concern and panic. And so we're helping them to address those types of concerns. So what we do is we say, let's, let's talk about that resiliency toolbox. Let's talk about what you can do to stay focused and tap into yourself. And so I always share my own personal story when it comes to resiliency is like, I grew up in, in Bombay, um, and in London and 
one of the things that I started at a very young age when I was 16 is to start with this thing called the resiliency toolbox. And I remember, remember January 1993, and overnight I saw millions of people their houses were burned down overnight because of the slums, uh, because of the uh, the communal riots. And so what we, uh, what I saw was children lost everything. They lost their homes. They lost their, their place to live. They didn't have access to education. And so every day I help them to practice gratitude. It is so important to recognize that we really should be grateful for everything that we have practice resiliency and realize you really are stronger than you than you think. And as, I mean, I've survived 9-11, Hurricane Harvey, um, lost three people to this pandemic. Um, and then just every day is telling them, focusing on what you can control. That's the most important thing. I'm sorry to hear you've lost people during the pandemic. Um, one of the things that people helped. often say, oh, no, no, go, please. I'm just saying it ultimately makes you realize that what's important is realizing what's important to you in life is that connection, especially going through what we're going through with this pandemic is that connection with friends, family, and within Chevron, we have amazing employee networks. And I'm inspired every day by the stories we see at Chevron, where we're seeing people helping with shipping masks around the world. Um, and we're really helping, we're seeing people connecting with people on workplace in ways that we never thought imaginable before. Everyone has come out of their comfort zone and we're really in this together. So it's uh, really made me just ground myself and realize what's important in life and what your priorities are. There are, I'm told, questions in the chat box. I'm going to look for that in a second, but um, it's not a while we have you. Um, I want to, you talked about the pandemic of racism is very real. And uh, there's, a, I think, an incredibly important and meaningful reckoning happening right now, speaking specifically about the United States. Um, but I know it's happening elsewhere in the world. When people come to you and uh, raise issues, either they're a manager working to, to, to think about their own diversity practices or their employees who feel like they've encountered some sort of bias or bigotry. What's in the toolbox there? So we actually see both ends of the spectrum. So we will see, we, we have uh, seen people who um, want to say something. Um, the fact is racism is something that for the longest time uh, people of color, including myself, um, have suppressed discussing racism or politics in the workplace. And so this is all very new to people. So what we do is for those people who want to speak up about it, they want to do it in a respectful manner in the workplace in a way that they will be heard. So the first thing I do is give them the tools. Tell them first, manage your emotions before you even speak up about it. Also think about what the other person's perspective is. Don't add to the noise. So try and hear their perspective and challenge them respectfully and say, I heard you saying this about a certain ethnicity that may not have been your intent. Do you may be making generalizations that could be perceived as being racist? So can you please help me to understand what your thoughts were behind that? And the more that people start engaging in dialogue, the more comfortable people will be to have those conversations, right? That's the basis that Martin Luther King talked about was we really do need to start having those conversations to be able to overcome that conflict that we're feeling with racism. But then we're also seeing people from the other spectrum who are really concerned about, well, I feel as if I'm being labeled a racist. And all I said was I didn't understand why was it considered to be a murder? I don't understand, but now I'm a racist. And so we're helping those people to start their own journey and what is what it means to be an ally, to start understanding 
what it means to be African American in this country. And it's not just about being an African American's country. I mean, even in, around the world, it's a global organization. So it can be being in, in Australia and in England, there's racism around the world. But start trying to understand what it is that you don't understand before you make the statement and practice emotional intelligence. I mean, it is amazing to me how just having basic emotional intelligence can help you in having those conversations safely in the workplace. So we just go through that, we role play those conversations, and we also help leaders because within our organization, our leaders are not putting their head in the sand when it comes to discussing this topic. But there are some managers who are really not comfortable talking about it. And so we give them the tools they need. We have inclusion, OE moments, as we call them at Chevron. And we help them to talk about bias they've all experienced, whether you are um, Black, Caucasian, Asian, um, and also Asians talking about what it was like to be Asian right now going through COVID and sharing their stories. So the more we talk, the more we share our stories, the more we're going to understand one another. And that's the only way to get through this together is just let's start talking about it. Let's stop hiding behind the, the curtain and let's start having those conversations about racism and, and the history for what it really is. Andy, let me bring you in on this conversation around uh, race, uh, specifically as it pertains to mindfulness and meditation. I'll, I'll, I'll reveal my bias, which is that I do think meditation can be very useful. Because what is meditation other than getting familiar with your own inner landscape, your own inner dialogue, all of these often very horrifying thoughts that are sneaking around somewhere back here between your ears and behind your eyes that you don't want to look at, but that are there nonetheless. And when you don't see them, they are driving you blindly. Um, people are worried about being uncomfortable, but I think the discomfort is good. Uh, when handled correctly with some self-compassion, with some clear seeing, um, because that allows you to, to open up to your biases in a way that then you're not so driven by your biases. It can make you a much more, it can help you create a fairer and more equitable environment. So having laid my biases out on the table here, I'd be interested to hear what your view is on whether meditation and mindfulness can be helpful in this incredibly important discussion we're having right now. They can absolutely um, be helpful. And um, <clears throat> a great place for someone to start if they're interested in this, of course, is the um, the book by Rhonda McGee, um, The Inner Work of Racial Justice, I believe is, I don't know if that's exactly the title. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but the first thing, again, is to notice that we all have, we all have um, biases. They're part of the human brain. Um, and it's something that we just need to be aware of. There, they're below um, awareness most of the time, implicit bias. And again, that's a normal thing. And the challenge is not to make them go away. The challenge is to recognize them and call them out and get familiar with them so that you know how to kind of counterbalance them if they come up. So I think in that way, mindfulness is really important because um, when we sit, when we meditate, all these, all these things come up, you know? And um, it gives us an opportunity to investigate how our minds work. Um, another thing is this idea of reacting, of the fact that these, these conversations it can be very difficult. They can trigger us. And um, people can feel very defensive in these situations. And it helps to have to be able to pause in the middle of those situations when they arise to say, okay, how am I feeling? How is this impacting me? And to like improve the way you process and metabolize stressful events. That's the way I think about mindfulness. It's like, um, it's not about bouncing back or, or, you know, a magic wand, but it's about improving your ability to take things in and kind of work with them and get them through the, through your system. And, um, and, but it's not easy. And that's why we have people like Donna who can create a, a supportive environment, which is another thing that I think is really important for these discussions. You, what are you, you, you already helped us with uh, the question I'm about to ask, which is from somebody in the uh, audience. The question was, can you recommend any good books? You recommended The Inner, Inner Work of Racial Justice by Rhonda McGee. 
Um, I'll add to that, there's a book called Radical Dharma uh, by Angel Kyoto Williams and the Reverend, uh, uh, and, and sorry, Lama Rod Owens. Um, and then there's another book that I would recommend uh, called Mindful of Race. Um, I would recommend all of those uh, as books that can help people um, really dive into the work here of using mindfulness to help you navigate these really, this really difficult but incredibly meaningful and important uh, domain. One of the things that's really landed with me when looking at these books and interviewing the, the authors is that you don't need to do this work like it's eating vegetables or you don't need to do the work because uh, you want to score PC or wokeness points. You can do the work because it's actually invigorating and incredibly meaningful. And to, to learn about your own mind, which then can allow you to improve your relationships with the people around you, uh, that is ex actually really exciting once you can get more comfortable with the discomfort. Uh, so that's my pitch. Uh, but we do have other questions here from the audience. Um, and so let me direct this one at you, Sana. Uh, this one is, says, how open should I be with my employer? I don't want to seem not able to do my job. So, uh, so uh, we do get that question sometimes, and those are the people who are having challenges with workload right now, and also may not be able to do their job, frankly, with children or dependents or whatever those might be, even psychologically, not being able to do that. I always, one, we have an amazing internal uh, employee assistance program uh, that ha we have mental health therapists that, that help with respect and handling the mental health support that they need. But if you do not have those conversations with your supervisor sooner rather than later, then you do risk your performance spiraling and then you you find yourself putting yourself in a in a in a kind of vicious cycle of poor performance and then uh, uh, performance improvement plans and and um, having challenges there. Right now, supervisors, at least at Chevron, uh, are practicing empathy, and they're told, "Let's do everything we can to help our employees to be successful." And they're not expecting people to be there two hundred percent as it was working in the office environment right now. So starting that conversation with their supervisor, role playing, having that conversation, that's what I would do as an ombuds with them, but making a list of the things that they think need to be done, prioritizing what they think uh, needs to be accomplished this week and having those conversations daily, um, if not weekly uh, with their supervisor is essential, especially right now with uh, different problems that's going on in the world. Very sorry to interrupt you. I, I, I apologize for that. Um, let me just follow up with another question here that's related. Um, Sana, and I think this is a good one for you. Uh, the question is, how do you address staff guilt? And again, this is an audience question here. When you're not, uh, sorry, when you're working from home, you're not being seen by your supervisors and you're more likely to want to make an impression by working longer hours, not taking vacation, or more so being afraid to ask for time off. How can you make employees feel less stressed about this? So we actually encourage people to take their vacation. We have vacation for a reason and you don't have to take vacation and go away. Um, may not be able to go to Times Square and visit you in New York, Dan, but uh, we'll be able to uh, take a staycation, sometimes just switching off that computer and walking away and having those boundaries. Um, that's a good thing for your mental health. If you're not able to look after yourself, how are you supposed to look after others? How are you supposed to perform? So that's number one, first look after yourself. But the second is that guilt aspect. The fact is what you can do is talk about what is visible, what is showing demonstrable impact. And if you can have that conversation with your supervisor at the beginning of the week, ask them what's important to them, then you know that those are things that I need to do to be successful and accomplish those things for my supervisor and make that more visible. The other things that you can do, I mean, at Chevron, we have things that we do in the workplace. You can get engaged that way. We have so many forums where people can be visible through um, employee network events, um, uh, talks, um, presentations. So there are things you can do to be visible in the workplace as well. It doesn't have to be 
um, you doing the work you're doing at home as well. But those conversations need to happen with the supervisor to set those goals. Thank you, Sana. Andy, here's a question for you. Uh, do other companies have a chief mindfulness officer? Just as a reminder to folks, Andy was chief mindfulness officer at Aetna. Are there other companies that have this? I, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I'm not familiar with people who have that exact title. I think that title can show up in consulting firms sometime. But there are many people who have roles in organizations who basically do what I was doing. One of the people that comes to mind is Scott Shute, who's at LinkedIn, who is the, uh, um, he's the VP of Mindfulness and Compassion, I believe is his title, and he's doing great work. So if you're on LinkedIn, he's a good person to follow. Um, and there's other organizations, including EY, IBM, SAP, who have dedicated a lot of resources to bringing mindfulness in-house. And sometimes that's, a f that's through formal programs, sometimes that's through informal programs. But I think more and more people are recognizing the value of mindfulness and, and there are people doing this work in many organizations under different titles, some doing it off the side of their desk, some, some being paid to do it full time. So it definitely is a trend that we're seeing. We only have a couple minutes left here, but I think it'd be useful, uh, Andy, for you to, we've talked a lot about meditation in the abstract, but to get a little bit more granular, because the first question that came in from the audience reads thusly, what specific skills or techniques can you suggest to best manage anxiety and stress? So everybody knows what meditation is, again, at least in the abstract. Can you just sort of walk us through how we can do this thing? How we can um, practice meditation, Dan? Yes, yes. <clears throat> well, one of the simplest things that we can do is we can, we can uh, arrange our posture so that it's alert and balanced, and then we can simply um, allow, us, allow our eyes to close and to tune into the sensations of the breath. And just notice what it feels like to breathe, not what you think it feels like or what it should feel like, but actually notice the sensations. And I find if you, if you focus on the tip of your nose, the nostrils, that's a good place to start. Just notice what the breath feels like as it goes in and out of the body. And you'll notice that you get distracted very quickly by thoughts or sensations or emotions. And when you get distracted, simply recognize that distraction, and then gently guide your awareness back to the sensations of breathing. And if we can do that practice for just five or 10 minutes, and you really don't need an app to do this, that's kind of, uh, I think, the dirty secret in the, the mindfulness world, that you don't need any equipment. You just need a brain, and you need to be breathing. And um, just set your timer on, on your iPhone, and try observing your breath for just five minutes, and see what happens, see what, see what it does for you. Yeah, and I think just to say in the final seconds here, people get very hung up on this distraction piece. I hear from people all the time. I sat down and tried to meditate and my mind was all over the place. That is proof that you are doing it correctly. If you're noticing that your mind is out of control, you are winning at meditation because the whole point of meditation is to see how chaotic it is in here so that the chaos doesn't own you. So go for it, people. And uh, I'm more pro app than Andy, but uh, I have I have skin in the game. Um, uh, Andy and Sana, thank you very much. Really appreciate it, and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Dan.